Uh, welcome, Sir Leszek. Thank you. The more I hear people use uh, the term after COVID, after this is, is done, I'm sensing less optimism about it being completely out of our minds when people use this uh, term and more um, an acceptance that the world is going to look uh, different in, in so many ways. Um, I think one of the other uh, elements that I take out of the history of, of plagues, particularly in medieval Europe, is the fact that we still don't completely understand why certain cities, for example, were hit more than other cities. Of course, there's interesting conjecture about this, um, yeah. but but I think it uh, there's a similar conversation that has happened since the beginning of, of this pandemic about why certain countries have fared better at different times and places. Um, very often, uh, without a clear understanding of what may have produced the conditions that allowed a country to combat COVID in the early phases. I think there are some countries, uh, particularly in East Asia, where at this point we, we hear virtually nothing about a subsequent wave, significant mortality. And I'm wondering from your perspective as somebody who's advised uh, governments both in Europe and in Asia in planning health systems, um, what do you think help prepare those countries uh, fare as well as they have? And, and can that be sustained? Can we learn from that uh, in Europe and the United States? Hmm. I, I think the answer, the, the short answer to your question is SARS. That the countries that have fared particularly well actually had a practice run at this pandemic with a very similar agent because every pandemic depends on the nature of the pathogen that's involved. And in essence, the SARS pathogen, this is a variant of the SARS pathogen, to put it crudely. Um, and those countries therefore had a run to develop systems. So they had well-developed contact tracing. They already had a population that was prepared and had been locked down in the face of that uh, earlier epidemic that hit those countries. Uh, they were able to get society to accept the measures that needed to be taken very early on. If we see those pictures from Korea, South Korea in particular, as to how uh, uh, effective their uh, lockdowns worked. So I would say part of it is a trial run, that they therefore were prepared and had the infrastructure and systems already in place. In many countries in the, uh, Western Europe and now in Central Europe, those systems uh, exist, but they were never put to the stress test of the SARS pandemic. So now when COVID hits, um, remember the major burden of disease now is not an infectious disease, it's cardiovascular disease, it's cancer. That's what's affecting secretaries of state, uh, ministers of health throughout uh, most countries. They've got to actually ensure that those uh, uh, conditions are taken care of. You know yourself the importance of having good infrastructure for mental health facilities for the population. So now on top of that system is already stressed uh, economically. You now add a further burden and that burden hits in ways that um, you might not anticipate. So the tragedy of India, for example, that we're seeing where there's just insufficient oxygen supply in very small hospitals because the system is not built around very large hospitals, built around small ones. Maintaining supply of a critical product like that is, is something that uh, might not have been anticipated um, as a need for all of those areas. So tragically, we live and learn. Um, and I believe that this uh, pandemic will have taught us a lot. I think there will be greater opportunity for the public to influence politicians that we have to be better prepared next time. But we also have to ask the questions, prepared for what? This is not flu. We were all prepared for flu. It's on every country's risk register. But this uh, virus behaves differently from the flu virus. It evolves differently from the flu virus. So we have to be not just prepared, but prepared for the differences that exist and to be able to mobilize um, effective management very, very quickly. Would that stop a pandemic? Uh, probably not in its tracks. It will develop, but you can minimize the lethal consequences of a pandemic uh, by better preparedness. The other 
major area is, I would say, how well we are accepting as a society, and by that I mean a global society, uh, as well as how countries are prepared to invest in public health measures rather than personal health measures. Um, and that's a debate that society will need to have. Um, not, this does not come for free. In the United Kingdom, we invest about 10% of the health budget on public health measures. Is that the right ratio? If you want to be better prepared, you're going to have to spend a bigger fraction, which means you will remove less from other sides of health, or you have to tax the population more to be able to pay for it. It doesn't come for free. So I think we will be mentally better prepared for uh, society. We will be probably more accepting when a lockdown needs to take place that we have to respond to it because it does work. Um, but we also have to recognize that there comes a point where these pathogens that cause pandemics, they don't disappear. The plague uh, bacterium is still with us today. It's just not, uh, it, we can control it. It doesn't kill that many. Ebola can be controlled. Flu can be controlled. COVID will be controlled in the future, but it will not disappear. There will still be cases of COVID going on. We have to learn to live with them rather than expect their total eradication. You know, we've only eradicated one pathogen, smallpox and maybe polio is on the way. When we, you know, it takes global action on an uh, enormous scale to eradicate them, but we can't eradicate all pathogens. Has this experience changed the way we think about vaccine development um, in indications other than coronavirus and the speed with which we can develop vaccines? Or is this, uh, has this experience been a one-off that um, gives us pause about doing things at the speed we, we have? Um, I guess a follow-up to that question. It, yeah. I, I, it's a good question. Um, I think it has changed the speed. It's shown what can be done. I think it's a good exemplar of good collaboration between um, uh, state organized systems where they have responded uh, appropriately uh, and with the uh, private sector, because we have to remember the only uh, capacity to make vaccines exists in the private sector. It does not exist in the public sector and would be far too expensive to create. So it shows that there was a responsibility on all sides to respond to this pandemic. The way in which we were able to study it um, was great. But I think that was driven by the urgency of the need. So you could say that these very large studies that were conducted so quickly, they're not conducted maybe with the very highest levels of rigor, say uh, an anti-cancer uh, uh, mod treatment modification would be conducted in as much as it had to be done very quickly. And you're doing a trial which is more pragmatic than uh, uh, absolute in terms of its certainty. So by the very scale of those trials we've seen the very rare complication that is observed with some vaccines at the present time but in reality those vaccines protect extremely well so those things will often come out in uh, long-term uh, follow-up will it change forever the way in which we operate it shows what we can do and therefore we need as scientists and clinicians to look to utilize this um, ability where speed is of the essence to do that, while at the same time remembering that for many the paramount issue is going to be the safety as well as the efficacy the trials have to prove. So I think we're going to see that we've now learned we can do it um, and we can do so very responsibly as a society and very ethically as a society and we can coordinate globally to achieve it, but will we coordinate every trial globally in this way? I suspect not, because they are far more specific to certain disease types and are much more comparative studies that need to be done treatment A against B, C, D and E to work out which is uh, uh, better for individual patients and conditions. So it will impact, but it will not impact in every case. As um, economies reopen, our hospitals uh, here are back to normal in terms of the patient mix we're used to seeing. Um, uh, people are so optimistic at, at this moment about what vaccines are going to provide um, to societies that have been in lockdown now for about a year on and off. And um, I'm wondering if 
uh, you know, at this moment, there aren't some folks asking themselves, we did this quickly, could have we done it even more quickly with um, challenge uh, type trials uh, we, to test vaccines on people who might volunteer to be exposed to the virus to make this happen faster. And, you know, there's, there's part of me that understands that, another part of me that thinks morally and ethically we're in a better place for having gotten to the point we are now without that. Um, what's your view on that? It's a very interesting question. I mean, I know challenge studies, uh, uh, for example, for malaria have been done for many, many years. Britain led the way with common cold studies uh, where people were actually infected with the common cold uh, and are prepared to volunteer for that. I think there was a strong case for challenge studies in COVID, particularly young people who are prepared to, to take that risk. Where the problem is, is you cannot necessarily at the present time offer guaranteed medication that will actually pull you through if you ended up with a more difficult area. I think challenge studies work well where, for example, in malaria, even if something were to go wrong, you know you've actually got the medication to pull 99.99% of individuals out of it. There is a risk. The volunteer has to understand the risk. Key here is that the volunteer understands what they're letting themselves in for and that the full ethics of that trial have been considered by bodies external to those who wish to, uh, to take on those studies. They have to be very carefully constructed, but they can advance particularly novel types of vaccines very, very quickly. I do see that one thing that most people think of, they still think of vaccination as the triple vaccine we get as kids. They may occasionally think HPV vaccine, which they get in adolescence. What they don't understand, the whole vaccine industry has moved on a pace. You know, we have better rabies vaccines, Japanese B encephalitis, all for very specific uh, purposes of people who are going to be exposed at high risk. You know, when I travel to rural parts of Africa, yes, I have been covered because I've worked there for a period of time with rabies vaccines. It, it is there, for example, for veterinary workers and elsewhere. The, most of the population wouldn't be uh, aware of it. And yet we're developing more and more vaccines for specific age groups, specific risks. One of the latest ones, for example, is, is to prevent shingles occurring in uh, 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 around the, the recurrence of chickenpox uh, vaccine uh, a virus in individuals. So there are a myriad of vaccines available and they will also open the door to really fascinating vaccines. Um, for me, obviously, in my world, what about an anti-cancer vaccine? Not anti-all cancers, but anti-specific cancers if you're high risk. What about therapeutic vaccines where we use the body's immune system triggered by a vaccine to actually eradicate a condition? That's what I spent most of my uh, research life working on um, to, to actually try to develop these agents that we harness the power of the immune system to actually counter something that's going on in our body. So open your mind to what vaccines could achieve. Um, it could be really fantastic. Um, they could act as blocking agents too to certain in certain disorders. So I think our mindset as to what vaccines are, COVID fits into our normal panel of what a vaccine does. There's an awful lot more that vaccines can do um, if we develop them appropriately and ethically. And maybe challenge might be some of the uh, studies, but they have to be very carefully controlled because otherwise we lose trust of people and volunteers and that would be disastrous. So I want to um, respect uh, respect uh, your time in this conversation. So to wrap up with just a few more questions, maybe one thing Please. that's on a, a lot of uh, people's minds is the long term consequences of, of the pandemic. And, and we've touched on some of them. Uh, one thing we haven't touched on is the impact on on children. I um, yeah have a, a young niece, 18 months old, who uh, basically has known no other world except for one within COVID and yeah. virtually has no had, had no interaction with people outside of uh, her family. Um, I like to think that the resiliency of youth and sort of the plasticity of, of the yeah. young brain is, is protective for uh, young folks. Uh, but I think is particularly in, in my world in psychiatry and adolescence and certainly in other areas too, it's been a hugely destabilizing force. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious as to uh, your thoughts on 
on um, yeah. the impacts on, on young people? Uh, I, like yourself, I'm trusting to resilience uh, that in reality, the adaptability of mankind to, 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 to deal with this. I think some of the economic consequences where we could potentially see more economic stress with unemployment, as you know, that has a big impact on individuals' mental health and uh, activities and educational opportunity will create. I think education will have seen some changes. We, uh, as a consequence, we've seen blended learning coming more into it. We're starting to see, though, also the importance of the societal aspects of education, where by previously people were saying, oh, you could do it all online. Nobody's saying that now. We now know that you need the societal component uh, for children um, and students to be able to learn to interact with each other and to look at different views uh, that they will possess. But I think there's also something else that's coming through, um, uh, an interest in longer term consequences of infection. Uh, um, in your world and in mine, one of the areas we share is this uh, problem with fatigue syndromes that people have experienced. And very often I've worked with some of these patients for a, a lot of time. They were often laughed at or put aside that it doesn't matter. Now we're talking about long COVID in quite an open way so that some people get an untoward consequence in the longer term. So I think there's going to be a lot more also about the resilience of individuals. Sometimes you also think that we forget a very Victorian and more longer term historical perspective is after serious illness, particularly serious infectious illnesses, there is a natural period of convalescence. You don't just suddenly jump out of bed and start, to start dealing with 30 or 40 different aspects of your work. Your body does need time to recover. Uh, infections have big impacts on the metabolic consequences on the individual. They have big impacts on the mental health of individuals um, and people need time to readapt and reassert themselves. So maybe we will also learn more respect for the natural powers of recovery, both the society and individuals and give that time and space to individuals uh, to have the best uh, recovery possible. I think if we come away from this as a more compassionate society that uh, yeah. accepts, understands and supports chronic illnesses, that would be um, one of the positive uh, uh, side effects uh, of, it, of it, it would be brilliant if it does. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm also cynical enough to believe that in the longer term, economics will, uh, will, will dominate. But in the short term, let's take advantage of it while we've got it and get people to reappraise why us being together as a society is far more powerful than, than just being loners in that society. Thank you, Sir Leszek. Na zakończenie chciałem tylko zapytać, czy miał profesor ostatnio może przed COVID-em szansę odwiedzić Polskę lub w najbliższym czasie planuje jakąś wizytę w Polsce? Tak, ja bardzo często bywałem ostatnie 5-6 lat w Polsce. Miałem wielki zaszczyt otrzymać honorowy tytuł z Uniwersytetu Białego Stoku, gdzie moi rodzice pochodzą z tego rejonu. I w, w Krakowie też otrzymałem od Jagońskiego Uniwersytetu dyplom. To naprawdę bardzo przyjemnie zawsze wracać do, do, do Polski. I wciąż współpracuję z Max Planck Institute i ten Dioscury program, który jest prowadzony w Polsce. I mam nadzieję, że więcej centrum w Polsce będą chcieli się dołączyć do, te, do takich stosunków międzynarodowych, te, tak jak TS, który prowadzi. To mam nadzieję, że będę w, w Polsce. Rezultaty z piłki nożnej jeszcze wczoraj, to wątpię, żebym był w Gdańsku, bo Arsenal przegrał wczoraj, to, to nie wiemy, czy będą, ja, będą e, e, w, w, grać w, w, w Gdańsku. Ale mam nadzieję, że kiedyś w tym powrócę. Białystok jeden z moich ulubionych miastach w Polsce. I w takim razie, jak tylko sytuacja pandemiczna będzie opanowana w Polsce, z ogromną przyjemnością, jaką impact chcielibyśmy już teraz oficjalnie zaprosić pana profesora na kolejne stacjonarne edycje Impact. Podczas, mam nadzieję, możemy kontynuować na żywo naszą rozmowę. Dziękuję bardzo za, za, za rozmowę dzisiaj.